This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. With China's reform and opening up has come a change in the country's immigration policies, but opening for outsiders to come into China has remained relatively conservative, despite a number of initiatives by the Chinese government to attract top talents to the country. When it comes to immigration, how can we view the opportunities and dangers for China and the attractions and pitfalls for those who might like to come here, not to mention the influences of a patriotism, security and economic opportunity. To discuss these issues and more, I'm happy to be joined in the studio by Harvey Zordin, freelance columnist for China Daily. Just as America has slammed its golden door on immigrants, China can benefit from opening theirs. And Gaston Chi, CEO of the Bigo Education and Executive Committee at the British Chamber of Commerce. I think the uh, Chinese government uh, stand is very clear. If you can contribute, China welcomes you. Obviously, you both see the broad smile of the host country. We'll also speak to Duan Kuang by telephone, founding manager or managing partner of a Qiming Venture Partners. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. Before we begin, let's take a look at this. Steve Tingay from the UK is the only foreign employee at this Chinese industrial ceramics company. Bringing his expertise in manufacturing, Tingay is in charge of the company's global sales and technical consultation. With the help of his company's human resources staff, Ting Gei applied for permanent residence in China last August and received his green card just before Christmas. After living in China for 13 years, he no longer has to renew a work visa year after year. Well, entry and exit from China now is, is, is a little more simple. Uh, I don't have to fill in quite as many forms, either on leaving China or in coming back to China, which is a good thing. I'm also able now to buy property in Beijing. Uh, I'm also able to buy a, uh, the car registration in Beijing as well. Last year, China's public security department implemented multiple new immigration policies to make it easier for foreign scientists, scholars, company managers and investors to stay in China. Experts in the fields of innovation and technology are particularly welcome. Here in Beijing's Zhongguancun Science Park, which is known as China's Silicon Valley, special express windows have been set up for high-level foreign talents to apply for Chinese permanent residency. The approval process has been largely shortened to 50 working days. Thank you. Zhong Guansun granted 156 green cards in 2016, which accounted for about a third of Beijing's total. The applicants mainly come from industries that Zhong Guansun particularly wants to develop. For example, artificial intelligence, information technology, new material, biological medicine, and big data. Zhong Guansun has set up a points-based system to help those who have not yet met the green card criteria. Foreigners who score 70 points or above will receive a recommendation letter from Zhong Guansun when applying for permanent residence. Evaluation criteria include education, work experiences, length of stay in China, as well as an assessment from an appraisal committee. Forty-five foreigners have received a recommendation letter from Zhong Guansun since the policy took effect last October. Feng Xing for CGTN in Beijing. Harvey, what do you think are the major reasons why it's so difficult for an expat to have a green card in the host country? Well, speaking about China, I think it's because China has changed a lot in the last decades, especially since the reform and opening up. 
in feudal times, China was closed off for large portions to the outside. Because we thought we were the central kingdom. Right, exactly. And at the beginning of new China, uh, foreigners were suspect. We were ghettoized, really, in, in your country. And I think the regulations still have a, a taste or a smell of that. But now China is different. It's open, much more open, and uh, people can really make a contribution here. And in foreigners making a contribution to China, they themselves get knowledge too. Well, uh, xenophobia of uh, little boxes uh, would be something ridiculous for the present day China and its people. What do you think uh, of the uh, visa policy uh, today? Uh, is it as difficult as before? I think it has improved uh, over the years, and I agree with uh, Harvey. But one thing we got to understand is the size of China, it's eight times of Russia, 10 times of America, and 100 times of France, and 200 times of UK. You are so, talking about the population, I believe, not yes. the territorial size. T no, territorial size. I'm speaking of territorial size. No, uh, Russia is a lot bigger than China, I'm afraid. It's, it's OK, then. Um, population. Population-wise, population-wise. <clears throat> so, it's a lot for the government to really uh, attract foreign talents by understanding what can they contribute to China. But over the years, it has, it has improved. Um, it's easier now compared to five years ago. And if you look at foreign talents, we have last year, I think, nearly 900,000 uh, people uh, that's applying for, for work visa. And, and, and the green light that the government is giving uh, is that if you can contribute, we welcome you. What are the criteria for your contribution, basically? Well, I think, uh, as in the intro, people have to have done something to be able to have the skills to contribute to China. They're not just going to uh, come here and be uh, freeloaders or uh, enjoy themselves. China is a developing country, although it's developed a lot. Mm -hmm. So people with good experience can make uh, great contributions to your country, to this country. What are those things that motivate a foreigner to stay here applying for a visa, uh, I mean, green card? I think China itself, it's now called the awakened dragon. Uh, and, and it has a certain myth to China. I mean, for the younger generation, um, you know, when we talk about China, it's where it is hating. Uh, it is where economic uh, benefit is. But I'm afraid you are talking on behalf of uh, ethnic Chinese in Southeast Asian nation, like Malaysia, your mother country. Yeah, I'm from Malaysia, that's right. Uh, therefore, Harvey may disagree. Well, I have a, I have a, a story to tell, a short story. Um, there was a bank robber in New York named Willie Sutton. He made many successful bank robberies. He was finally caught. But the police asked him, Willie, why did you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. <laughs> I think a lot of us foreigners mm -hmm. come to China because it's where the action is. It's where the money is. So there's tremendous opportunities here in this growing, dynamic economy. Sure, it's hard for us to understand. The culture is different. But that is what helps make it exciting as exactly. well as challenging. Money would help rebuild a country that was uh, plagued by our uh, civil strife, by power struggles, by the poverty itself for decades since the founding of the PRC. But behind the money, I'm afraid, we need to have other inspirations like uh, faith, values, the idea of a rule of law that may come along with your entry into this territory. Do you think in this particular area you guys can make enormous contributions? Harvey. <laughs> uh, thanks. Fun to me. Um, I think in so we can make contributions in terms of uh, business knowledge, in terms of how to um, get deals done, to use some, somebody's phrase. Um, and I think there are some other areas. I'm trained as a lawyer. The legal system has a long way to go here. So I think it's a matter of prioritizing some of our contributions. And I think we start with helping on a level of commerce, but we help in other areas where we can, like uh, rule of law. Rule of law, yes, indeed. Mm. It's one of the hallmarks characterizing the social progress of China, other than how much money you can earn from this host country. But what do you think of your index of happiness as a, an expat here? Index of happiness. Um, personally, because um, I think I'm still young, 
Uh, you know, there's a lot I of think energy. I'm still young too. You are young. Ray is young. Um, but um, my family name is Yang. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. And um, but China, it's like it's adventurous. I would say, and it's always changing. So so in terms of happiness, I would say that if I embrace a learning spirit, and not coming here to say that that's how we do it. Um, back in my country, or that's how we do it somewhere else, and being willing to embrace what China is, um, I think I'm 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 happy uh, being in China. If not, I'm not going to be here for. I've been here for nearly half a decade, so I'm happy. Well, uh, don't forget we have a third party for this dialogue, Duan Kang, who is standing by and on the phone. He wants to join our discussion about. Uh, Benefits and challenges for expats. Now he is a Chinese. He gave up his American citizenship at least one decade ago. But next, uh, to invite him for a more profound discussion, the issue of patriotism might be uh, more entertaining and uh, more serious. So, Duan, what do you think of uh, your mixed feeling between <coughs> staying in the United States or coming back and make contribution? W what were your thoughts? at that critical moment when you decided to give up the American citizenship. Because yesterday we were discussing Professor Yang Jinning who was aged 94 and he married a girl a lot younger than him and that caused a lot of uh, discussions here in this uh, new uh, country. In, in fact, it's his ancestral land. We were talking about patriotism. I'd like to have your thoughts. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think uh, before I get there, I'll, I'll probably make one quick comment on the earlier point. Uh, you know, China, I think for China, this is a, a coming of age. Uh, China has been quite friendly to uh, sort of transient uh, business visits for non-Chinese uh, for a long time. In fact, that, that's how I first came back as, as an expat in uh, 1994. Uh, now, the, the so-called coming of age is we increasingly see non-Chinese citizens uh, who look at China not as a, uh, a destination for a very temporary sharing of you know, his expertise or his or her expertise and, and just spending you know, a few months or, or maybe up to a year as an expat, but more as a destination to build a successful career. And, uh, and and that's that's quite different these days from uh, say you know 10 20 years ago when I uh, 20 some years ago when I first came back to to China here as an but, but wait a minute uh, Duan uh, since the Chinese government wants to level the playing field uh, years after our entry into the WTO in 2001 do you think opportunities decrease sharply for expats to have uh, the dream job and uh, therefore, from the Barcelona center of CBD in Beijing, for example, you see less and less expats here. I, I, I disagree. I disagree. Uh, I, I think the, the need for so-called expat specialists have decreased because of the, uh, the ability of the local talents. Uh, you know, I came back with a multinational company, Cisco, and back then, a lot of the uh, you know, senior or even mid-level executives in these multinational uh, firms in China were all experts. These days, these levels were all occupied by very capable locals. Now, a different phenomenon is that we, you know, I, I'm in the uh, venture capital uh, industry right now. We are seeing non-Chinese citizens launching local business here. And, uh, and, and, and that means these particular founders look at China uh, very much as, as Harvey was, was uh, alluding to earlier, as a land of opportunity mm -hmm. to build a career, to build uh, you know, a, a number of years of their life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think this part of it is a lot more profound. Let me, then, let me, excuse me, Duan, let me bring you back to the issue of a patriotism. Uh, yes. Many of my colleagues and those who follow uh, similar cases like yours uh, would point out in time, look, uh, you've lived in the United States for years and now you come back. Uh, um, what do you think of your own national identity, particularly your attitudes towards American values, your cultural roots, your ethnicity itself? Uh, that, that, that's a, a, a great question and, and it's... Uh, 
it, it, it's, it's actually a fairly complex uh, question because you know, I, I left China when I was fairly young. I left when I was 18 and spent the next uh, 15 years in, in America. I uh, studied and you know, got all my uh, uh, university degrees, worked a number of years, and then first was sent back to China to work as an expat. I still remember when I first came back, uh, you know, all the, I, I felt it was going to be a temporary assignment. So even when I went out and purchased my electronic appliances, I made sure it was universal adapters so that I could uh, you know, very soon take it back to Silicon Valley, where my home was back then. Uh, five years passed, 10 years passed, 20 years passed, and then you know, 25 years passed, and I'm still here. So, uh, uh, so, so increasingly, I felt it is quite difficult to narrowly define patriotism in this uh, day and age. I think more, it, it's a lot easier and a lot more meaningful to, uh, to, to, to look at one's identity, what you, who you identify with. So for many of us who were born and raised here, uh, I think we, we certainly identify uh, with certainly the Chinese ethnicity. Uh, I spent many years in the States. I, I get along with many of my, you know, my American friends. Uh, but value-wise, I think I identify with the American value more, uh, even, even today. I, I, I would think more like an American uh, when it comes to a lot of the value considerations. Thank you very much, Joanne, for joining us. In the first part of the program, you are watching Dialogue with uh, Harvey Zodin and Gaston Chi. Joining us on the phone is Duan Kang, a uh, very successful Chinese entrepreneur. And we're discussing the issue of patriotism as well as broadly the issue of immigration in the age of globalization. Now, this is a, a difficult and tough issue for President Donald Trump. We'll come back in a short while. Stay with us, please. Is unemployment threatening Jordan's stability? They're young, educated, and unemployed, and they say Syrians are stealing their jobs. Welcome back. The Chineseness threatens to be diluted in the age of globalization and those who chose to emigrate to the United States would somehow be accused of uh, not being very patriotic. And immediately, uh, you have very robust response from those uh, Chinese immigrants. They say, no, I'm still patriotic. I still love my country. But I travel and I immigrate for an economic reason, not as, uh, as an uh, economic asylum seeker. But what do you think of this uh, sensitive issue of uh, patriotism? Such a, it's a complicated issue. I love my country. I love China. And so I feel uh, betwixt and between. I feel um, a love of uh, both of them. And I think it's a very nice position to be in. in. In my country, on our great seal of the United States, we have a saying, e pluribus unum, from many, one. It originally was used as a symbol for the 13 colonies coming together as one country. But we can also say that uh, at the end of the 19th century, when many immigrants came to America, um, many became one and brought their uh, vast experiences to make a much stronger country. Um, in China, although you have the 56 uh, minority groups plus the majority group Han, I think bringing foreigners here, providing us with opportunities to uh, share with each other will make China, even with your great and rich history, a much stronger country. Well, many of the uh, immigrants from Italy turn out to be the mafia in New York. No, just a small Godfather. <laughs> That's the uh, very impressive image that Hollywood presents to the rest of the world. 
uh, it's, it's meant to be a joke. But uh, we still have many Chinatowns uh, in so many countries. Does that help keep and protect the Chineseness? Just, just, just coming back to, to, to Harvey's point, I, I love the fact that you use love uh, to, to, to talk about patriotism. And I think, it's, um, I think love works both ways. And I think it's the same as patriotism as well, that it works both ways. But I think we need to come to a point that you cannot have two wives. You can only choose one and you can be committed to it. And, 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 and I think um, it's like what you said, it's a very sensitive topic. Um, but I wouldn't say that people who have immigrated doesn't necessarily love their country. And, and, and I, think, I think that uh, in the past, uh, perhaps um, China has not really recognized um, what contribution uh, that, that people can bring to his country. But now it, it is recognizing. And since Deng Xiaoping's time, 800 million people has been lived out of poverty. That itself shows that you know, that they care for their people. And from that onwards, they extend that friendship to the outside world. After that, they know the role that they need to play in a globalized world. Well, Gaston, that raises an interesting point. And the point is about dual citizenship, dual nationality. America um, allows it under limited circumstances. China does not really allow it. Many people think that this is an issue that uh, merits further discussion mm -hmm. and debate. I'm one of them. I believe that China should study the uh, possibility of dual nationality. Why? Because a lot of Chinese people have lost their Chinese nationality by going overseas and assuming another passport. They still love China. They still respect its culture. But they what? still have, wait, let me finish. They still have ties here. If they had the dual nationality, I think it's almost like having their cake and eating it too. It's better for them, it's better for the other passport holder country, and it's great for China. But Harvey, why would they want to have another passport when they can have a 10 years visa or 20 years visa and they can extend after that? It, it, for me, it doesn't really make sense. I think I agree with you to some extent that China can study what America is doing, but I think that we've got to understand that China is different and we've got to play by Chinese rules. No, no, I'm not saying America allows uh, dual nationality. They do under very limited circumstances. But I'm saying it should be considered in this country because it allows you to have your cake and eat it too. I think it'll bring back a lot of Chinese who've lost their citizenship, who love their country, and allow them to make a contribution here as well as the other country for which they have a passport. I think not studying this issue, uh, if the government doesn't do that here, they'll, they'll be remiss and they're missing an opportunity. Yeah, there'll be a severe uh, brain drain as a result of our refusal to change, if not reverse, the immigration policy. But, but, but let's look at international students. There's about 190,000 Chinese students in the UK as of last year. And if you look at the past 10 years, the trend, um, as of last year, 80% of that decides to return to motherland and they do not want to be outside. One of the main reasons is because the economic engine is in China. And secondly, I think that they recognize that China as a country is playing its part in the world. And China, it's a point connecting the rest of the world. So, so I, think, I think we've got to separate different age groups. I think the young, the young ones, uh, the ones that um, you know, they are, they, are, they, are, they are looking to play a bigger role, I think, I think China is where but they want to I'm afraid, Gaston, be. you have seriously underestimated the impact of a Brexit. It occurred as a result of uh, the widespread concerns of particularly the blue-collar workers uh, for the issue of immigration. Now, mm -hmm. migrant workers from Eastern and Central European countries, due to the expansion of the European Union, were able to find their way to old European countries like the United Kingdom, who would not, by any means, become a melting pot, um, a country of immigration like the United States. And therefore, there will be far less opportunities for the Chinese students to find jobs there. Mm -hmm. When I was studying in the UK between 94 and 93, last century, um, unless one of the criteria for the Chinese student to have a job in the host country is unless and until the locals could now work uh, in this particular industry or occupation, then it could, we could consider you, your application. Mm -hmm. But the time of your time, China is different compared to the time of now. 
the millennials they are born when China builds Olympics. The millennials they are born when they know that you know China is contributing to Africa. We are proud of being Chinese. I've never been prouder of my Chinese roots until I came over to China. So, so I think I think knowing that I think I think I think you're right in a way that the British government during your time they they, they kind of limit visa, uh, and then you got to be highly skilled to be to be there. Um, but, but I think the fact is that we understand that China is no longer local, it's global. That's right. right. We are fast becoming not just a regional power, but the powerhouse for the world economic recovery. Let me cross over to Duan Kang for his comments on the issue of dual nationality. Is it true that uh, this, uh, the alleged stupidity of this uh, policy has prevented more uh, brilliant Chinese scholars and uh, students from coming back and uh, contribute to the economic reconstruction here in their motherland. Duan? Uh, it, it, it certainly plays a role, uh, but I, I think it, it's more of a technicality. And uh, as Skizen was, was saying, I, I think uh, a, uh, a much easier visa regime would have helped. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and, and having dual nationality uh, would, would help, but it also brings along uh, a number of issues. Thank you very much, Duan. Uh, but Harvey, what are the consequences arising from dual nationality? Because we have millions of ethnic Chinese scattered throughout the whole world. If we allow for dual nationality, then many of them could have much more margin for flexibility. And then it's likely to cause a strong rebound from nationalists here in this country who complain about the job opportunities. Well, I think that uh, the middle ground and maybe the correct ground is to start with uh, people uh, of Chinese heritage or people who were Chinese citizens and left and, and lost it. If you can just do that, I think it's a step in the right direction. This issue of nationalism is very interesting as well. We're seeing that with Brexit. We're seeing it in uh, America because when economic times are tough or perceived as tough, the people in a country um, are anti-immigrant and do everything they can to, to block people from coming in. And, and this, is a, this is a serious problem. But I think if you start with people of Chinese heritage and uh, Chinese former citizens, this is a good beginning. Let me ask you one final question before we wrap up this uh, enlightening discussion about immigration in the age of globalization. Now, we seem to have met a paradoxical phenomenon. On the one hand, we see the rise of populism and rejection, and increasingly so, of immigration in the United States and the rise of far-right movement in the French election. Brexit is part of that uh, consequences. On the other hand, uh, with the dynamics uh, in globalization, uh, the traditional idea and borders of a nation state uh, should be diluted somehow with the regional integration. We see uh, diametrically opposed ideas uh, with one like rejecting immigration, uh, part of the presidential uh, vows on the campaign trail by President Donald Trump. And the other is um, like the European Union. They have the Schengen Agreement, uh, although it is being endangered by the, the challenges of a refugee crisis. So what do you think of these two um, opposite directions? I think it depends how uh, people are uh, led to believe the economic situation is. I think uh, this anti-immigrant feeling moves directly with how people perceive uh, econ uh, economic uh, indicators. If they think their jobs are going to be lost, they're going to be against internationalization and um, multicultural and uh, multinationalism. But if, if they can see that this burden, uh, that this uh, resource is being shared by many people, then I think it's a much better situation. You are very, very philosophical and you don't give me a definite answer. But Gaston, do you believe traditional borders are, borders are likely to be closed uh, in the foreseeable future due to the rise of populism? I think on the contrary, it's going to be open. Um, it's going to, borders will be open um, regardless of, of, of um, what the current Trump administration is um, because um, we are living in a world that it's interconnected. So in a way, we should downplay the significance of uh, populism across the uh, Atlantic Ocean in Europe and United, in the United States. Thank you for being with us. Until next time, goodbye.
This is CGTN, China Global Television Network.